Hello everyone, Happy New Year. Uh, we've refreshed the liturgy, changed the liturgy a little bit, well I've changed it all together, uh, New Year, New Liturgy, uh, but the same conventions apply. Uh, if you've got a print copy in front of you then everything in bold type is what we say together, everything in light type is what I say on my own. If you're following this on the screen, everything in yellow type is what we say together. So let's begin. In the beginning, before time, before people, before the world began, God was. Here and now, among us, beside us, enlisting the people of the earth for the purposes of heaven, God is. In the future, when we will have turned to dust, and all we know has found its fulfilment, God will be. Let us pray. Loving God, you are faithful, just and forgiving. Help us now to grasp the greatness of your love. Where we have failed to love and loved to hurt, forgive us and heal us. Where we have scorned difference and have been indifferent to those in need, forgive us and heal us. Where we have spoken harsh words to others and have been quick to take offence ourselves, forgive us and heal us. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. There is no one like our God We will praise you 
I was looking through some old photographs uh, the other day and came across quite a few of me when I was a child, which was interesting, uh, and one in particular which I'm going to show to you, uh, which is me in my brand new school uniform. I had passed the 11 plus, uh, and I was the only one in my school to pass the 11 plus. Uh, and everybody was pleased for me, which was nice. Um, but this, uh, look at the photo. I mean, he looks very smart, doesn't he? Uh, and uh, my family are very proud. Uh, but I know, looking now, I know he's scared. He's scared uh, of everything. And if I were to be able to go and speak to my 11-year-old self, I would be saying to him, don't worry. Please don't worry about anything because it's all going to work out and it is going to be all right. And of course, we'd all love to have that opportunity, wouldn't we really, to go back and speak to our younger selves maybe and possibly give a little bit of advice. Um, God's gift to us is the now. The, we're entering into this second period of national lockdown and there, there are lots of concerns around and you will have heard lots of stuff about school and the fact that schools are not open and, and what a significantly bad outcome will happen for lots of our children because of this. And you may, you may just be thinking, oh, blimey, I don't know. I don't like the sound of this. And you might be a bit scared. Well, I would say to you, don't. Don't be scared. Well, that's easy for me to say, isn't it? Because I'm not you. But I know how things worked out for me over the period, uh, over the period of my life. Uh, and that's why I would be saying to my 11-year-old self, please don't worry about anything. Uh, and all the markers uh, that everybody's worried about for you, they were worried about for me too. I mean, I was... I was considered a clever child. Well, past the 11 plus, I must be, mustn't I? But it didn't last. <laughs> I took nine O levels and I failed six. I retook five of them and I failed them again. I took three A levels. I managed to talk myself onto three A levels. And I failed all of those. So by any measure, my life should have been miserable, shouldn't it, really? Uh, failed at everything. Uh, and that's what I thought at the age of 18. I thought, oh, that's the end of me. Uh, what sort of life am I going to have? Uh, found myself a little job. Uh, got myself sorted out. Uh, went on to another job after that. Settled in. Got comfortable. Uh, my boss said to me, after I'd been there a couple of years, I'd like you to do an ONC in business studies. And I said, well, I don't do study anymore. I mean, I'm rubbish at that. I can't do it. And he said, well, if you do this course, uh, which I will pay for, I'll give you an extra £500 a year. And it doesn't matter if you fail the course. I won't take that money away. Ooh. All right, I'll do the course. So I got an ONC in business studies and another O level in accounting along the way. Oh, maybe I can study. Maybe I'm not thick after all. And then a little while after that, I went to college to study to be a minister. And I got a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology. And in my 40s, I studied for a master's degree and I've got an MTH in applied theology. Don't worry. Don't worry about anything. 
it will all work out. God's gift to you is today. Uh, look for God in today. Look for opportunities to serve God today. Look for things to thank God for today. This is God's gift to you and to me. Don't worry about the future. Uh, you can't, can't do anything about that uh, at the minute. Um, it will unfold in front of you and opportunities will come your way. Make the most of them. Make the best of them. Do the best that you can. Be the best that you can be. But please don't worry about anything. Uh, and when people tell you, oh, life is terrible uh, and it's miserable and oh, how awful, ignore that. <laughs> it's not terrible. God's gift to you is today. Uh, and there are lots of opportunities for you to do things today. Uh, don't worry about the past. You can't change that now. What has happened has happened. Uh, don't worry about the future because you can't affect that. Live in the moment. Live today. What's this got to do? with the patriarch Jacob, because we're going to be thinking about Jacob for the next few weeks, in fact, from now, all the way up until Easter. Well, on the face of it, nothing much, actually. But when you look at his life, his life is not straightforward. His life is full of struggle. And he's scared a lot of the time. But it all works out. It works out because God has his hand on him. My life worked out, is working out, because God has got his hand on me. Your life will work out because, friends, God has got his hand on you. That's why I can say with confidence, don't worry. That's why I would say to my 11-year-old self, don't worry. This all works out. Everything will work out for you. It won't be plain sailing all the time. Of course it won't. Uh, if your life is anything like normal, and I guess it will be normal, there'll be some seasons which are really turbulent and really odd and somewhat difficult. But remember, God's hand is on you and all this stuff will work out. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Trust God. It will all work out. Love.
The reading is taken from Genesis chapter 25 and beginning at verse 19, Jacob and Esau. This is the account of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this his brother came out, with his hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skilful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew, I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Amen. Today sees the start of a new series. Uh, we're going to be thinking about uh, Jacob, the patriarch, um, from the book of Genesis. Uh, and we're going to be following his life and times all the way through up until Easter, uh, when obviously we'll, we'll deal with Easter themes. Uh, and then after that, something different will be coming our way. Um, you remember, don't you, Abraham and Sarah, the the first great patriarch, the the first man to whom God makes a promise about generations of uh, descendants that will be greater than the numbers of stars in the sky and sand on the seashore. And you remember that uh, both Abraham and Sarah are really quite old when this call comes to them. In fact, both well past the age of childbearing, uh, but miraculously, uh, Sarah does fall pregnant and they have a son, Isaac. Isaac is the child of the promise. So through Isaac, this promise will be fulfilled. He will have um, numerous descendants as well. Interesting to just hold that in the back of your head as this story begins to unfold. You don't hear much about Isaac, actually. Um, but if we'd gone into chapter 24 of Genesis, we would have seen the careful planning that went into finding a wife for Isaac. Uh, and a servant of Abraham is sent uh, to uh, kinsmen to find a wife for Isaac. Uh, and the servant prays that God will direct him to the right person. Uh, and that seems to be what happens. In fact, that is what happens. Uh, and they come back and Isaac marries Rebecca. 20 years they're married and no child. Rebecca's barren. What is God playing at to promise descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky? more numerous than the grains of sand on the seashore. And then to choose a wife for the child of the promise, who is barren. 
What is God doing? I think God proves himself to each succeeding generation. I think each successive generation needs to find the truth about God for themselves. You can tell stories to your children about God and about the goodness of God. You can do that and we should do that. Uh, and it, it's one of the great hallmarks, certainly, of the Old Testament people of God, the Jews, would tell stories. I mean, that's what Passover is all about. They tell the story, and even to this day, they tell the story of how the angel of death passed over uh, the houses of the Jews so that they were delivered, their firstborn were safe. Um, so the telling of stories of God's faithfulness is important and must happen. Otherwise, why am I doing what I'm doing? Because all of what I do is really about recounting the faithful the faithfulness of God uh, down through the years. But people won't believe this until they're ready to believe it, if you see what I mean. They, <clears throat> you can't make your children believe what you believe. What you can do is you can live consistently with the values that you profess. You can live consistently as though the gospel were true, which, you know, I've been saying to you for as long as I've been here. Uh, and your witness, both in word and deed, will speak to those around you and to your children at some point they will either embrace faith in god or they won't you can't do anything about that you all you can do is live consistently and once once you've done that uh, and once they've come to their view about what they're going to do well that is that effectively uh, but i think mission is generational as well as geographical. That's really the point that I want to make from this. Um, Abram and Sarah eventually believed God. <laughs> it took them a long time and they, they believed God would bring about the, the promise of a child. But they also, you know, they, they veered off the path along the way and tried to make it happen for themselves. And I think all of us have some of that experience at some point. You know, we know God has, has said something to us and God has uh, encouraged us in some way. Uh, but we get impatient and wonder why is it taking so long? So let's just help God along by trying to engineer the circumstances and make it happen more quickly. And you can't do that. You just have to learn to trust. You have to be patient and wait for God to do what he says he's going to do. Uh, and again, I think, you know, th this is what eventually happened with Abraham and Sarah. And this is what happens with Isaac and Rebecca. Uh, she is shown to be barren and, and Isaac, bless him, prays for his wife, it says, doesn't it, in our reading. Uh, and she falls pregnant, which is wonderful. And not only does she have one child, uh, in her womb. She has two. She's got twins. She's carrying twins. So blessing upon blessing uh, for Rebecca and Isaac. And we can see something of uh, the promise that God gave to Abraham beginning to unfold. Um, so he, here are these two children in the womb. And there's a lot of jostling going on. Uh, and it's uncomfortable for Rebecca. And she says, what is going on? Um, and she inquires of the Lord. And she receives this prophecy, doesn't she? In verse 23, you're carrying two nations in your womb. Uh, and the older will serve the younger. And that's quite a surprise. Because that's not the way round that we understand things to be. 
God seems to be turning things upside down. There's something called uh, primogeniture, that, and that's to do with the rights of the firstborn. And whole societies uh, work on this basis. You know that the eldest has primacy. Uh, the eldest is the one that holds everything, that receives everything, that inherits everything. Uh, and so to hear this prophecy, the older will serve the younger. There's a clue here that these children are not going to be what we expect. Uh, these children of the next generation of the promise. And again, there's, there's something here for us to think about. We sort of think, don't we, that people of faith will somehow be, well, they'll be nice. Uh, if, or if not, <laughs> if not be nice, then at least be acceptable. Uh, we'll be acceptable to one another somehow. Uh, and people outside of the household of faith certainly have an expectation about the character of people of faith. Uh, and when we don't fit, it gets extremely difficult for people looking on. And it gets extremely difficult for us uh, when we expect something from our sisters and brothers in Christ and it doesn't necessarily fit the way that we think they don't look the way that we think they should look. They don't behave in the way that we think they should behave. Um, the, there's something odd going on in this story. Uh, and it ought to wake us up to something which is really basic. And it is this. God is sovereign. So what you think and what I think should be the pattern for Christian character doesn't come into it. It is what God ordains. It's what God says will be. Now, there are all sorts of places we can go in Scripture and we can talk about particularly, I would say, the fruit of the Spirit. And we can expect to find some of that, if not all of it, uh, in Christian sisters and brothers. Well, of course we should. Uh, I'm not saying we should ignore any of that. But why is it that there are so many uh, around us that are slightly spiky? Why is it that there are so many that rub us up the wrong way? Not in our fellowship. We're lovely, aren't we? But you know what I mean, don't you? Why is it there's always one? And usually there is. God will have his way. And, and this story, the story of uh, Jacob, is all about conflict. It's not about peace and harmony. His story is marked by conflict. And it starts in the womb with this jostling, this struggle. Um, and he's not going to be first out. <laughs> uh, Esau is going to be the first one to be born, the oldest. Uh, and uh, he he's born and he's uh, he, he's red in colour and he's very hairy. Um, the authorised version, you know, which uh, was lampooned um, in the 1960s, uh, by the beyond the fringe crowd and I know I'm speaking to a generation now uh, that's older than me so there aren't many of us left but you will you'll remember you know and Esau was an hairy man but Jacob was a smooth man uh, and then you know there's this sort of lampooning of uh, expositional preaching which we love uh, <clears throat> but Esau is red and he's hairy and he's uh, and he's first out and grasping his heel comes his brother second uh, and the names you know are, are interesting uh, Jacob the one who dogs your footsteps and it also means twister you can't trust this man effectively 
And this is God's choice. The older will serve the younger. I wonder why God chooses like that. The text doesn't give us an answer to that question. And that's something else that we find difficult, isn't it? You know, we we come with questions and we expect answers. We're with that sort of generation and with that sort of culture. We and we demand, don't we, sometimes answers to our questions. And they don't always come. And the the story, the narrative is entirely silent on why God chooses the younger and not the older. Uh, and they're very different characters. Esau, the oldest, he's uh, a man of the countryside. Uh, he likes to hunt. He likes to get out and about in the countryside. He can, he knows what the birds are. He knows what the animals are. He knows how to hunt. He knows how to dress his kill for the table. He, he knows how to do all that sort of stuff. Jacob is a quieter man. He stays near the tents. He's not so prone to travelling, to getting out and about. Uh, and Isaac loves Esau and Rebecca loves Jacob. Conflict is sown in this family from the very beginning. Uh, it is not a story of harmony and concord. It's a story of conflict and separation and division. And God will work in spite of this and in the midst of all of this. So, the thing that we know most readily, the thing that comes to mind most readily when we talk about Esau and Jacob, the two brothers, is the way that Esau sells his birthright <clears throat> gives away gives it away effectively um having been out in the fields uh as it were hunting and and doing all the stuff that he does he comes in uh from his day and he's hungry and jacob has been cooking and he's got some stew on and it smells delicious and as esau comes through the door he says wow that, that smells great give me some stew i'm starving and jacob says sell me your birthright first what good is a birthright to a starving man come on no promise me you give me your birthright all right then i promise give me this stew and that's what happens uh, and it says in the scripture that we read, Esau despises his birthright. Um, what good is a birthright to a dying man? Something about the language that Esau uses strikes me here. And, and I wish I could say that I am not prone to this, but I am. And I think we're, we live in a culture that is very prone uh, to doing what Esau did. And that is to massively overstating uh our experience massively overstating the importance of it massively overstating uh the circumstance that we find ourselves in <clears throat> what he's not starving he's not dying he's just hungry and how often have i said that <clears throat> excuse me how often have you said that oh i'm starving no you're not you're just hungry but we do this, we massively overstate this extravagant use of language. Um, and because we do it so often, what happens is we devalue some of the language that we use. Um, because we know actually it doesn't mean that. When someone says they're starving, we know they're not. We know they mean, I'm hungry, I'm really hungry. But that's what they mean. Uh, and we don't we don't say plainly what we mean. We embellish and we over egg the pudding. Uh, and I, th I think there's a warning for me as a preacher in this. And hopefully there's a warning for you too. Just in the way that we speak to one another, speak about one another and speak with one another. You know, not 
not to be extravagant in the use of our language so very often so that language loses its meaning. Jesus says, doesn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount, um, don't swear by this, that or the other. Just simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Uh, speak plainly. So there's a lesson for me, I think, in that. So anyway, by swearing this oath, by, you know, Esau saying, yes, of course, I'll swear this oath. Uh, this binding promise, he's, despi he's despised his birthright. He's lost it. Uh, the short term gain for him is food in his stomach. Um, the long term loss is immense and phenomenal. And he does not realise what he's done at this point. He will come to realise it. Uh, and this will, you know, we will come to this in due course in a week or two. Um, he's lost his father's blessing uh, at this moment. He doesn't realise that's what he's done, but that is exactly what he's done. And this has massive knock-on consequences for the two brothers uh, as the story unfolds. This is an enigmatic story. It is a very odd story in lots of ways. Uh, because it doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, it doesn't follow a pattern that we think it should follow. The, the firstborn does not get everything. The firstborn gives away his birthright. It is the younger one that gets everything. It's the younger one that receives father's blessing. It's the younger one that God has chosen. It's the younger one through whom God will work his promise out. And this is a scandalous story because of that. And the values of the kingdom of God are scandalous. And we, we don't use that word very often, but I think it's true. And you see this in the way that Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God. And, and, and we see an, <clears throat> an example in flesh and blood here. I mean, Jesus will say, the first will be last and the last will be first in the kingdom of God. There's an inversion of the world's views and the world's understanding uh, in the kingdom of God. And we're happy to embrace that because so very often we see ourselves, don't we, as the ones who are not privileged in the world. But I'm an older brother. I'm, I'm the oldest child in my family. Uh, so this, this really brings me up short sometimes when I see this. And I have to learn humility. And I think many of us in the Western developed world would do well to learn some humility when we come to think about the kingdom of God and to think about the values of the kingdom and the way that God operates. We, we need to be ready to play our part and to do all that God has called us to do. But we must understand what we said earlier. God is sovereign and he will do what he wants to do with whomsoever he chooses, when he chooses. Our part is to be ready to join in with him when he calls us. It'll be interesting, won't it, to see how this story unfolds and how God works his purpose out. But right now I'm shocked. I am scandalised at the way God is tipping the world upside down in this family. See you soon. Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist without the knowledge of your parenthood and your loving care. But now I am your son, I am adopted in your family, and I can never be alone. Cause Father God, you're there beside me, I will sing 
your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. Father God, I wonder how I manage to exist without the knowledge of your parenthood and your loving care. But now I am your son, I am adopted in your family, and I never be alone, cause Father God, you're there beside me. I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises, I will sing your praises forevermore. Let us pray. Father God, we bring to you the needs of the world. Uh, we were shocked to see what happened in America earlier in the week. Uh, we pray for that great nation and ask that your peace would come. We know there's a, a great need for peace and rec reconciliation at this time. We can't for the life of us see how this is going to happen, but we believe that you have uh, the ability to do that and we pray that you will move the hearts and minds of all those in America to see properly, to understand the truth and to accept uh, the results of uh, properly constituted elections. We're saddened and shocked by what we've seen and pray that you will do all that you can through people of goodwill in that place. We particularly pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help them to be wise, Lord, and not to be stupid. We ask this with all of our hearts. Uh, we're concerned about what's happening in Hong Kong with a number of pro-democracy campaigners being arrested under a new security law brought in by China. Uh, they say it's to do with security, but it looks to those watching from the outside as though it's something else entirely. We pray for our friends in Hong Kong, uh, for all those that are interested in democracy and for uh, that system of government. We, we ask that you would strengthen and encourage them, uh, that you would give them courage to speak with boldness and that you would guard and protect them and their loved ones. We continue to pray for our own country. We're glad, Lord, uh, that the UK and European Union were able to come to agreement uh, about a new trade agreement before the end of the year. Uh, we look forward to seeing that unfold in the days that lie ahead. And we pray for the prosperity of both the European Union and the United Kingdom as they forge a new partnership together. We're also grateful, Father, for the new vaccines that are coming online. Uh, we pray for all those engaged with the production of vaccine, the packaging of it, uh, and the logistics of seeing it get out to uh, places where it can be used. We pray, Father, that, that there will be no hitches with this and that all that can be done will be done and that it will all be done in a timely fashion. Thank you for those who've already received their vaccines, have been vaccinated. Uh, we pray that many others will join them soon uh, and that we would be among those. 
thank you, Father, for the good things that are happening in our country. We pray for our friends, some who are grieving, some who are giving thanks, and some who are unwell and need to know the touch of your healing hand. So we pray for Chris, Ken, Adrienne and Hugh, Babs and Alan, Eric, Les, Dot, Margaret and Bob, Peter, Michaela, Dennis and Shirley, Mary, Jay, Terry, Naomi, Nigel, Lynn, Graham, Lauren and Lewis, Ron, Gail, Maureen, Joyce and Andy. Be all that they need in these days, Lord. We gather up our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We say the canticle together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>